Um, welcome to the ha Hyperledger Capital Markets Special Interest Group Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. That's always a mouthful. We're going to get started in, in a minute or, or two. Just want to give uh, people an opportunity to join. Um, if you're new to this meeting, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, if there's any particular information that you're interested in, um, I'll also put it in the chat. We like these meetings to be as interactive as possible. And we always want to be a, as open as possible to new members. So definitely welcome. And we're going to get started in a minute or so. I think and there's been... Welcome. Uh, I, oh, sorry, James, go ahead. I was just going to say, Anissa, welcome. Glad to see you were able to join. Hey there, thank you so much for the invite. Absolutely. You were saying, Marvin? Oh, I, I was about to say, there's been a lot of activity in the blockchain arena. Um, and, and I think in one of our first meetings, I, I remember the way we started it out was, um, blockchain is not crypto. So given how the crypto markets are, we want to reiterate, blockchain is not crypto. <laughs> okay, they're related, but... Uh, uh, Blockchain is much more than crypto. I, and with that, I, I see that we're at 9.01. So why don't we go ahead and, and get started? Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome to the Capital Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. This is our, our monthly meeting. This meeting is going to be a bit more technical in the past. We want to go through uh, some of the proof of concepts that we've done uh, on our end. But uh, we want to keep this as open and interactive as possible. And before we get started, uh, I always like to express our appreciation to Vipin, the chairman of the Capital Markets uh, Special Industry Group, and Karen, our Hyperledger point of contact, and, and all the folks at the Hyperledger Foundation for making this meeting possible. So thank you very much and, and welcome to everyone. As part of the Hyperledger Foundation, this meeting is being recorded. So just to make sure everyone knows, and it's under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation, we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions about specific company products and projects, don't make negative remarks about other companies or products, and please follow the code of conduct. Treat each other with respect, never discriminate, communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. And I've already mentioned for new participants, uh, please introduce yourselves and, and welcome. Okay, here's our agenda. We've gone through the welcome and the housekeeping. Uh, the next couple of slides are slides that we go through in, in every meeting. And I'm just gonna go through them really quickly. Uh, the reason that we're here is we're all on a blockchain journey. We like to start off with this because really the primary purpose of this group and, and this meeting is you guys are interested in blockchain. You may be looking at different technologies, building a blockchain application, or looking for customers for your blockchain app. Um, or maybe just taking your first step on the blockchain journey. So we're all on the same path, but we may be at different points along that path. This group is intended to help everyone and lift up everyone along this journey. So just please keep that in mind. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, the Hyperledger community. Um, on the next couple of slides, these next three slides, uh, I'll just briefly mention, they provide links to uh, for Hyperledger and training, and we're including them for sharing purposes. If you'd like additional information on the Hyperledger Foundation, this slide provides that for the foundation, um, Hyperledger, Linux, uh, the capital markets. And then right here, second from the bottom, this is the link to the capital market special interest group, the, the mortgage industry subgroup. So we'll go through some of the information that's contained in that. But these are great resources and we always wanna make sure you guys know about. Uh, also to access this information, you're gonna need an LFID. I'm not gonna go through this, but the information is here on how to get an LFID and access some of this information. Next is the blockchain training slide. 
th these are links to free blockchain training. Again, we want to educate everyone as much as possible. This training is free, so definitely take advantage of it. With that, I want to turn it over to James Hendricks. He's going to walk us through the state of blockchain in the global mortgage industry. James. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marvin. Appreciate that greatly. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the timeline slide. Okay, so for those of you that have been attending with us uh, on a monthly basis, we've actually modified this timeline now. We've broken it out between our global and our U.S. Uh, research and articles that we've been finding. Um, you know, taking a look at the content that you're seeing on this slide, all of these articles and research are available over on the wiki site. Um, as we look at, you know, 2022 and some of the articles that we've been discussing, the two in the bottom in white, those are the ones that we're actually going to focus on today. And both of them happen to come out of the Latin American area. Um, Marvin, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. So to start off, um, LACNet, in February of this year, LACNet was launched in Latin America. They're a nonprofit that governs and orchestrates the LAC chain blockchain for the Latin American and Caribbean regions. Very similar to other global blockchain networks that we've talked about in the past from uh, Alastria and Spain, the EU has the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure or EBSI. China has a blockchain based service network or BSN. All of these offer a low cost, low risk way for organizations to participate in blockchain networks. So several applications are already live on the LAC network. In Peru, there's an app that's issued over 1 million certificates to provide proof of identity and skills. In the Caribbean, they're aiming to issue academic certificates. There's uh, DDDIDI, it's a digital identity system and it promotes financial inclusion for rural producers. And then there's also the IDB Bank. Uh, it's involved in an initiative for cross-border payments and they're working with Citibank and it's based on the LAC chain. So the underlying technology for this is Hyperledger Bezu and the network supports Tessera encrypted nodes. For, so for those of you that are looking for a little bit more about the technology, do take a look at the article. Um, we also have research available on some of these other global chains that are out there. So take a look at uh, the wiki as well, and you'll find a lot of useful information. Also coming out of the Latin America uh, area is Chainlink. So it is a decentralized Oracle network. Um, they've established a real estate platform serving the Latin America property market called LA Prop. LA Prop leverages uh, or allows investors to buy um, tokenized shares in various real world properties. I know we've talked a lot about the meta universe previously. Um, it does leverage Chainlink Keepers Node's operator's history of securing billions of dollars in DeFi markets. And the decentralized automation uh, service carries out tasks for smart contracts on the BNB chain and will automate secure rental payments to token holders of the given properties. In turn, this yields a percentage of income from rental properties. And with these rental properties, the payment terms, the schedules, they can all be customized on an individual property level. What this really does is it opens up an opportunity for retail investors to gain exposure into the retail or the real estate market. This is a market that, you know, historically it's inaccessible unless you've got large capital to be able to come to the table with. So a lot of new opportunities coming out of, out of Latin America in the last couple of months. Um, moving over to more of the U.S. sector. So again, taking a look at the U.S. timeline, we've broken these out um, by our previous articles, as well as the articles that we've talked about this year. You know, on the wiki site, you've got all of these articles and research as well as others. Um, and behind the scenes, we're actually gathering a massive list of different research articles that we've been finding. So I definitely encourage, if you guys have questions, if you're looking for information, check out the wiki. 
feel free to reach out to myself directly. I'd be happy to share with uh, you guys the other research that we've found. Also, I encourage everybody in attendance, hey, as you find articles and useful information out there that might be useful to the rest of the community, send them my way. I'd love to start tracking it as a part of our inventory, and they may be part of the articles that uh, we're discussing on a monthly basis. But let's go ahead and jump into the, the couple of key ones that we pulled out for this month on the next slide. So we're gonna start out with what is DART? Um, if you have not heard of DART yet, it is, uh, DART stands for Digital Asset Registration Technologies. It's a blockchain-based lien and e-note registry. Think of it as a blockchain alternative to MERS. Um, DART enables lenders to originate loans as fully digital assets, and then instantaneously trade them with counterparts on the provenance blockchain as digital tokens. The end result is a lien and e-note registry system that automatically listens to the immutable record on the chain. It can track loan ownership. It can track uh, e-note control, the location of these docs and the e-notes. And in addition to all the benefits of e-signing, DART is a cheaper alternative uh, for registering a loan than MERS. And it does not require the manual processes or data reconciliation that's involved in the tradi traditional life cycle of registering a loan. So at funding, a warehouse lender has fully perfected ownership prior to releasing funds, and they can take advantage of trilateral instantaneous transactions between the originator, the warehouser, and the investor. Investors are seeing the benefits of this. It allows for real-time real trading with no settlement risk, and they're able to buy assets literally within days of closing. So while mortgages are the first play for DART, ultimately DART is looking to be able to register other controllable asset classes, everything from car loans to student loans, personal loans, solar loans, quite a variety. So anticipate that we're gonna be hearing more and more about DART as we move forward um, and where DART's gonna be put into play outside of uh, the mortgage industry. And then lastly, I wanted to throw out something a little bit different for the group this time. These are a couple of podcasts that we found. Uh, again, links to these are available on the wiki. Um, but for those of you that like to listen to your information rather than reading it, uh, you know, whether you are driving to work or for some of us that work is that work drive is still the walk from the bedroom to the living room. Um, but yeah, these were some great podcasts that we found some information on. So, you know, the very first one where we talk about modernization of financial services with the Providence blockchain. This is a discussion with Morgan Kelly, the CEO of the Providence Blockchain Foundation. She talks about the evolution of blockchain over the last five years, her prior experience at Citibank and their blockchain exploration. The, plot, the podcast itself explores a variety of topics. So they go over proof of stake, stable coins, hash, digital uh, money, on-chain versus off-chain data, the overall current ecosystem of MERS figure loans and the provenance blockchain. As well, Morgan talks about the USDF consortium. If For those of you that are regular attendees of this meeting, um, you'll recall back in February, we talked about USDF uh, and what they're looking to do and the stable corn that they're looking to generate. Um, again, if you're looking for information on the wiki site, you're gonna find leaks, links to the recordings of those previous presentations, as well as links to the USDF consortium if you'd like to learn more. And then Morgan talks a little bit about, hey, what does she predict for the future in her crystal ball from uh, digital assets to NFTs to what's going on in the, the metaverse? We have a second podcast from Real Trends. Uh, Adam Brown, the VP of Business Development for Proppy.com. He does a discussion on Web3, crypto, blockchain, and for those of the, you that are not familiar with NFTs, what are NFTs? Um, Proppy actually conducted the first uh, Tampa Bay, Florida property that was sold as an NFT. It was a $600,000 uh, transaction. And he talks about how this is going to have an impact for the future of real estate. 
Um, Adam also talks about, you know, blockchain and the real real estate interest industry is still really in its infancy. You know, as we think about, hey, what type of information can we store on the blockchain? You know, we naturally jump to things like title, insurance information, claims, etc. But he talks about the other useful things that could be recorded relevant to a piece of real estate. For instance, as you have work done on the house and you have permits that need to be pulled, um, what are the materials that uh, the house is being constructed out of or additions that are occurring? All of this information can be recorded on the blockchain and it becomes very valuable information to a future homeowner. So some of the you know, things that we're looking at about what we can do with blockchain, they're starting to be turned on their heads a little bit and people are looking at different avenues um, for how to take advantage of this technology. Currently, Proppy is only storing closing data information, but they are looking to add additional information as they continue forward. So again, two great podcasts to uh, take a listen to. Each one's about an hour or so, um, and you can find the links on our wiki site. And in fact, speaking of our wiki site, Marvin, if you want to jump into the next page... Um, so here's an updated uh, graphic from our wiki site. In fact, I just dropped the link into the chat if you guys want quick access to it. Um, highly encourage everybody, you know, as you attend these meetings, um, follow the instructions Marvin talked about earlier about how to register your part as the mortgage industry subgroup. Once you'll do, you'll automatically be receiving the calendar in invites to future monthly presentations that we do. In addition, as we are updating uh, our articles and our research, you'll also get notifications when we're making updates there. Um, again, a quick breakdown of the site. Over on the right-hand side is where you're gonna find that global industry research, um, as well as over on the left-hand side for our subgroup page, you're gonna see uh, additional subpages. One of those subpages are all the previous articles that we've talked about as well. This information that we're curating, it's really for all of you to be able to use. So whether you're looking for use case scenarios, whether you're looking for information in order to help, you know, validate or sell projects to, to your senior management level, do take a look at this. There's a lot of useful information out there. And if you have additional questions, as I mentioned, feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to share uh, the additional research and information that we've garnered. Uh, at this point, Marvin, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you. Hey, uh, thanks, James. That's uh, great information. Um, just to let everyone know, I did listen to Morgan McKenney's podcast. That is a fantastic podcast. It, the nice thing about it is, is it's indexed, so you can skip to the section or the time period that you want, and it just contains some fabulous information, so I highly recommend it to everyone. Okay. Now let's talk about the proof of concept. Uh, on the slides, uh, we cover everything uh, along the blockchain journey. I mean, this is a journey, we mentioned that kind of at the very beginning, um, but this is the stage when a user usually goes, okay, I, I get the concept. Now show me that this stuff actually works. Walk the talk. That's what we wanna be able to demonstrate. Okay, first let me orient you on our POC matrix. Our, our proof of concept consisted of five different POCs across the top row. The information related to each POC is on the left-hand column. It, please note that the information here, it's not gonna be comp comprehensive, but we can definitely drill down if you have questions, either within this call or within a follow-up. The first two POCs were based on the Hyperledger asset transfer and fab car sample cases. We reviewed these with the subgroup at, I believe it was the January meeting. So we're, not, we're only gonna spend a brief period discussing these specific POCs. Both Hyperledger sample cases were extremely useful in providing us a base level of knowledge. How do you build and operate a blockchain for them? Once created, we were able to change the variables in these blockchain use cases and start to play around. With it. For example, we changed the names and data in the asset transfer and FabCar to make it more financial services and mortgage specific. 
We also experimented with creating and deleting nodes, containers, and, and companies. So as you drill down and take a look at the asset transfer and fab car, you can see that we did these on our local machines. We utilize Hyperledger Fabric. We initially started on Windows and, and Mac OS, and then we finally jumped to Linux. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that on both examples. We use both the Level DB and the Couch DB, the, the databases inherent within both of these uh, use cases, and, and then the nodes, containers, and companies. So really straightforward, and this is information that we've covered in previous meetings. Now let's skip to the next set of POCs that we didn't cover in the earlier meeting. Our next POC, the certificate app POC, that was an application for tracking employee data, specifically training and certificate data. However, we had several issues with this POC and we decided to switch to another effort. Uh, but before I get in, into the other POCs, let, let me just drill down on the certificate app a, a little bit. And this was an app that we initially started in Ethereum and switched to Fabric. I'll talk a little bit about why we made that switch. Again, it was Linux. Um, some of the information contained within this certificate app, we put in two separate databases. On-chain, we used LevelDB. Off-chain, we did MySQL. Uh, quite a few more nodes, specifically from the Hyperledger Fabric perspective, five nodes. Um, I, I wasn't able to record the number of containers, but if, that, if you guys have a question about that, let me know, a and one company. So th this, was, this was a stage where, okay, we know a little bit about what blockchain is and how to build it. This was our first attempt at building something that would be tangible, that would be usable, and that we could actually deploy. So we actually did deploy this in, in, in production for a period of time. Okay, uh, now let's go to the other POCs, the last two POCs on the right-hand side of the page, POC1 and POC2. This is where we thought, okay, we're badass. Let, let's go ahead and build something, okay? Uh, this was more specific to financial services and, and track and utilize customer data. For example, a user would enter customer data in a UI or front end, and then that information would be written to the blockchain. We did our initial development on a Mac OS laptop and then created the same uh, application in a Linux platform. So similar to the migration that we did for the certificate app. And, and then let me talk a little bit about why we did that. I and mean, we chose Ethereum for, excuse me, we chose uh, Ethereum for POC1 because it seemed easier and, and it allowed us to use Firefly. Firefly is a tool for building and managing a blockchain network and it made building and managing the network immensely easier. And, and that's something that I highly recommend. We're gonna cover that uh, on the next slide. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, once we were able to successfully write to our POC blockchain or POC1 blockchain, we upgraded it to more complex POC2. This POC2 version utilized outside data sources and APIs specifically using AWS tools. And, and let me just jump to the next slide and, and we can dive into some of those tools. So uh, again, focusing on POC1 and POC2, here are some of the tools that we utilize for POC1. Okay, Streamly, this is an open source app platform for machine learning and data science teams. This uh, served the same role that AWS would, and it allowed us to stand up an application and host an application very quickly and most importantly, for free. So we like Streamlit from that perspective. Heroku, that's a platform as a service, a P-A-A-S that enables developers to build, run, and operate applications entirely in the cloud. We used it for our credentials, uh, for our POC1 and our, our POC2 
applications. And then uh, finally, uh, on the POC2 uh, applications, you can see that we had another series of tools. We went from Heroku to AWS Gateway and Lambda. That was primarily for uh, being able to utilize third party information. I'll dive a little bit into that in, in the next slide. And, and then we also started to work with uh, CA Certificate Authority for Fabric. So those were the tool sets that we use. I'm not gonna talk too much about asset transfer and FabCar uh, since we covered that in previous um, calls. Let's talk about some of the challenges or errors that we ran across. Uh, I do wanna speak about the very first error that we had with asset transfer. As I said, we initially started this in Windows and we ended up using WSL. And that's when we realized hey, this is just not working. We're getting far too many errors. It's far too complex. And we actually got guidance from the Hyperledger, one of the Hyperledger forums to just uh, switch to Linux. So we did. So that's one of the first things that, that we learned. Um, on the certificate app, we did encounter some errors with I IPFS. Um, IPFS is interplanetary file system. It's similar to HTTP in that it allows you to transfer data from a peer-to-peer -peer network like a blockchain. And this is what we were using to write our PDFs to the blockchain. So if you remember the certificate app we were using to track training, including PDFs that people would get. So if you got a training certificate, we wanted to put that on the blockchain. We had some significant problems with writing that to the blockchain. And to be honest, we never really solved it. And we decided to switch our efforts to POC1. And, and I think that was well worth it. We did get most of the issues around the certificate app finished. But as I said, th this was a journey. This was a learning process. We didn't want to keep bashing our heads on this. So we switched to POC1. Now you can see here that latency is one of the big issues. In, if you've been in blockchain a while, you'll realize that two of the biggest criticisms that people have around blockchain is number one, it's operating cost. N number two, it's latency, response time. And, and we definitely experienced that. When we first started testing uh, on POC1, um, we weren't having any latency issues. And, and then when we started doing expanded testing, multiple simultaneous users, we noticed a sizable increase in latency. Refreshing the screen went from sub-second to multiple seconds. As we increased the number of users, the latency increased, and we even started to get some timeout errors. But unfortunately, we didn't save screenshots of those errors, but if you guys are interested, I'm sure we could recreate them. Uh, we realized that this was due to Ethereum, okay? When you take a look at Ethereum, it's transactions per second are usually in the seven to 12 uh, TPS. So not really that fast. Once we upgraded from POC1 to POC2 and switched from Ethereum to Hyperledger Fabric, all of the latency issues disappeared. Okay, one of the things to keep in mind, Fabric has the transactions per second, <clears throat> excuse me, of about 2,000 to 3,000 per second. So, and clearly I think that was uh, the reason that we were having some latency issues. And Fabric is just a much more robust um, blockchain platform to build upon. But uh, another thing to keep in mind, if you wanna contrast this with existing payment systems, existing payment systems today have a TPS of 10,000 to 50,000 transactions per second. So we have seen some uh, supercharged fabric instances that got up to 20,000 transactions per second, but I don't know if those are in production. And if you wanna have an off-call uh, off discussion about those, I, I'm sure we definitely could, but pl please keep that in mind. Uh, latency is potentially uh, an issue that you wanna be aware of. Then the very last issue, we were getting some cores issues so cores not really related to blockchain. It was due to an OS update that we did, but we included it here for um, completeness purposes. Um, let me stop there. I know I've been talking a lot. I've been throwing a bunch of information, a bunch of acronyms at you and just see if there are any questions. 
any areas that require clarification or if you've gone through this journey and had some of these headaches or uh, epiphanies saying, uh, please uh, let us know. So let me just pause for any questions. Okay, uh, if there aren't any questions, uh, let's go on to the next bit of information. Let's delve a bit into the architecture and different layers. Now, someone told me that in the era of cloud computing, the OSI framework is obsolete, okay? But we're going to borrow some of their terminology, but not necessarily their definitions. If we start from the top and drill down, the application layer includes the primary application engines, the UI, um, <clears throat> excuse me, smart contracts that specify metadata for customer financial information and methods that regulate data access rights, permissions, and policies. So the application primarily lives within the application layer as the name implies. However, within our blockchain environment, applications will not be able to change the existing blockchain settings. Also, applications involving data exchange can be developed at the application layer, but the majority of it will take place lower down in the technology stack at the platform layer, and, and we'll dive into that. If you shift over to the right-hand side, you can see some of the tools that we used at the application layer. We used React and Angular. These are different versions of JavaScript, so we were primarily using JavaScript, HTML5, and, and Bootstrap. Okay. On the distributed computing layer, in this consists of the core components that are needed to maintain the blockchain itself. This is where the heavy chain, uh, this is me, where the blockchain heavy lifting occurs. This includes such functions as consensus protocol, as uh, security, hashing, encryption, replication across nodes. That all takes place in this layer. And you can see how we were using this layer. On the right-hand side, we were using Hyperledger Firefly to help manage and, and build the blockchain. We were using Raft for consensus, and we were using AES-256 for hashing. Okay, continuing to drill down uh, on the layer, the platform layer, th this is where we have the different methods for getting financial data from different companies, for storing encrypted data securely, post metadata or data requests to the blockchain via smart contracts from the application layer, okay? Um, so you have your REST API, web API here. Uh, the protocols that we were using, uh, it's XML and JSON. We realized that JSON is starting to become more prevalent. So that's where we focused on. And then we were also using, as I mentioned on the previous slide, AWS's API Gateway and AWS's Lambda. Th those are the two tools that are very helpful in terms of setting and managing API. So highly recommend those tools. Then in the very last layer, this is the infrastructure layer. This is the blockchain layer. This is where the nodes live, storage, and the network. So I mentioned we initially started off with Ethereum and switched to Hyperledger Fabric. That was a great choice. Um, we were using AWS's EC2, S3, and their DynamoDB tools. So, um, and I'm sure that for the people that use Azure, there are gonna be comparable Azure tools that will live at this layer as well. And we can talk about those if that's something that you're interested in. So let me uh, again pause, see if there are any questions. Again, throwing a bunch of acronyms and terminology at you. And uh, hopefully it's not making your head spin too much. Okay, um, lessons learned. So it, to me, the, this is probably the most valuable section in, in the proof of concept. What were the lessons learned from all of this? 
First one, and I've mentioned this before, and apologies if this seems like a commercial for Hyperledger, but take advantage of the Hyperledger community and resources. It makes doing blockchain so much easier. There were the sample cases that I mentioned, there are the Hyperledger tools in specifically Firefly, Certificate Authority. There's a whole slew of, of Hyperledger tools that are out there that you could take advantage of. But to me, the real value were the user groups. Anytime we ran across an error and we posted to the user groups or, or we ping someone about some of the problems that we were having, there was always someone that had experienced it or that was willing to help us and say, hey, have you tried this? Have you tried that? I mean, for example, on the WSL issue, that was something that several people noticed right away and made the recommendation to switch either the Mac OS and, and Linux. So definitely take advantage of the Hyperledger community and resources. The other big learnings is latency. So I mentioned that we were using AWS in this. We were monitoring our AWS usage and performance uh, pretty closely, but there were times when uh, our usage spiked. So, it, and this was a, a proof of concept. So if this was an enterprise solution, this is where you would wanna take advantage of the AWS uh, dashboard, uh, their uh, utilization reports, just to make sure that you're managing those resources properly and efficiently, um, because late latency can be an issue. We already talked about the blockchain performance, Ethereum transactions per second versus Hyperledger Fabric. And, and then uh, the very last thing is test, 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 and, and test some more. Um, I went through this thinking, oh, we'll run a couple tests and then we'll be good. No, we had to do multiple tests. We had to do expansive testing. This is one where if it's a technology that you're not entirely aware of, you want to err on the side of caution and, and try to have a much more robust, and robust testing schema than what you normally would uh, for a, a proof of concept. So uh, again, let me pause there and, and see if there's any questions or, or comments. Okay. Hey Mark, this is Angel. Uh, yeah, great overview. Definitely this is a technical uh, discussion. And, and so I just talk a little bit about the team size, right? So, um, you know, a lot of people think big teams are better, small teams are better. But when you're doing something like this with the late, leading edge technology or a new technology like blockchain, what, what is your view on, on, on size of team? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I think size of team really does matter for a proof of concept. I would recommend starting off with a small team and a highly um, adaptive team, people that are open to new concepts, people that are not going to throw up their hands at the first air and say, you know, this is a bunch of crap. It's not going to work. Um, people that are open and willing to try different things. So uh, on our team, we had several interns that were helping us and we had a, a full stack developer. So if you take a look at a continuum of skill set, we, we had people at the ends of that continuum, people that were fairly new and people that were heavily experienced, and we were able to fill in the gap. So I think uh, that type of high performing agile team that, that's willing to take risks and, and to try different things. So smaller team, definitely best, but then when you're ready to step to an enterprise solution, that's when you're going to want to start to bolster uh, the team and, and bring out the heavyweights, people that are architects, people that uh, have uh, quite a bit of development under their belt so that you can really jumpstart the development effort. And we haven't gotten to that stage yet, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, projecting what's going to happen in the future or, or how to handle something like that. Does that answer your question, Angel? Yes, thank you. Yeah, Marvin, I think it's worth throwing in there too that you know, for the interns and stuff that we've had as a part of our team, most of these technologies were relatively new to each of them. Um, and they've been able in a matter of months to quickly get involved with each technology to, to pick it up and actually start applying it within our POCs. 
That, that's a great point. And, and I think that really points to how enthusiasm is, is a, a key part of making any proof of concept um, a, a success because if people are really interested in it, if, if people are willing to do stuff beyond what's on their task list and, and really do research on different boards, different technologies, ask people, hey, what are you doing around this stuff? It makes it a lot easier and also it makes it a lot more fun. Going through this proof of concept, I, I have to tell you guys, it, it was a lot of fun learning this stuff. It was a lot of fun finding out who's working in this and then going to things like the MBA conference and talking to people and saying, hey, what are you guys doing about this? The people that are working on this, you can see the enthusiasm in their face and they want to take this to the next level. And, and I think that's fantastic. I love that stuff. Yeah, I, I want to share a little bit from my perspective, more from a business perspective, stakeholder, sponsor perspective. Um, yeah, what I noticed working with blockchain, it, you know, it, it's just like any other technology that, that I had worked with in the past, right? So a project's a project, right? Uh, always keep the user in mind, you know, how are we going to make things better, right? And so um, those principles were were in each of those uh, uh, examples, whether it was a hyperledger use case like asset transfer or Fabcar, but once we started getting into building our own POCs and really applying the learning, it's just like any other project, right? What are the business requirements? What are we trying to achieve? You know, how are we going to get the information? You know, what are the business rules? What are the validations? How are we going to improve things? And so. When we started to look at uh, blockchain, blockchain started to, in the beginning, it was all blockchain, right? It's like, oh my God, we're working on blockchain. This is so cool. But once you start jumping in, it's a project. So for project professionals out there in the enterprise world and in the entrepreneur land, right? Uh, blockchain is a technology. You definitely got to learn it and use it and understand its strengths and weaknesses so that you can uh, design it correctly and uh, in, in how you're going to use it. But at the end of the day, again, this is from my perspective, from a business perspective, right? It's, it, it's a project. It's, it's about people. It, it's about communication, collaboration, uh, you know, understanding your, your customer, uh, cost benefit analysis, all those, all those important uh, tools that make a project su successful. Uh, we're there from the beginning, even even at the POC stage. So I just wanted to share that for, for what it's worth. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Angel. That that was uh, excellent feedback. Um, I, I noticed that on one of James' slides, uh, he had a cartoon with the or uh, a photo with a caption: "Blockchain is a solution looking for a problem." I, I I think that was a valid criticism before, but I think now as you talk as we talk about some of these blockchain solutions like figure provenance uh so there are quite a few other companies that are rolling out blockchain solutions out there some of them using hyperledger some not that that's no longer the case now i think it's much easier to do an roi on a blockchain solution and uh, there are a myriad of articles out there that blockchain is a way to become a more efficient and effective organization, especially in tandem with machine learning, with AI. It, it can help facilitate a, a lot of those technology projects. So with that, I'm gonna get off my soapbox and we're gonna go to the next slide. <laughs> Okay, so future agenda topics. We've gone through several demos. We've brought several vendors in. We've talked about uh, our POCs. One of the things that we haven't been able to address is bring in one of the GSEs. So we're still actively trying to bring in a GSE to bring the regulatory perspective into the blockchain discussion. So I know that several people have asked for that. We're actively working that. I think if we were able to successfully do that, that's gonna be fantastic. A uh, fantastic meeting will definitely let everyone know. If there are any other business cases that people are interested in, please let us know. We'll continue to build out uh, an agenda for our next meeting, and then we'll post the recording for today's meeting on the wiki so you guys can take a look at it as your leisure. We've noticed that there are quite a few people that take a look at these after the fact, and we definitely appreciate the feedback from those people as well. 
So uh, with that, I, I just want to open it up uh, one last time. If there are any questions or issues from anyone in the audience, uh, any feedback that you guys may provide, may want to provide, or, or just uh, open discussion. Yeah, Marvin, I, I just shared the link on the chat and I just want to talk a little bit about it. So everybody is on the blockchain journey and we're on different parts of that of that journey. Some of us are learning, you know, what is blockchain? And, and that's really hard, especially given all the headlines today with crypto, right? The crypto market um, is taking up all the headlines today. But, you know, blockchain is the underlying technology and cryptocurrencies are the applications of that underlying technology. Um, but I, I was really inspired by what James was sharing with um, the, the innovation and the investment that's happening in Latin America. I was, when he was sharing that information, I was thinking, wow, that, that's great. You know, this blockchain is definitely global, but it's becoming more global uh, with those investments. Asia and Europe have really been leading the forefront, have really been on the forefront of blockchain technology. And IBM as a global uh, vendor, you know, is a big part uh, in, in helping that happen. And so I wanted to share this uh, WeTrade, and we've talked about this before. Um, it's a joint venture of, of 14, 15 European banks uh, in Europe, and they all came together and they said, hey, we, we understand we, we, we understand technology, we understand blockchain, and uh, instead of all of us going and building our own blockchain solutions, let's build a blockchain uh, utility, like a consortium. So in, in this case, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's actually a joint venture, uh, acts like a consortium. And I, I really encourage people to take a look at this and use this in your research and business case as you talk to your teams and educate them about blockchain. Um, these are, this is, this has to do, this is a blockchain uh, technology, the world's first for, uh, and it's enterprise grade serving 14 banks and I think uh, like 12, uh, 12 countries or more, something like that. But it has to do with trade finance. And so the, there's a letter of credit, um, which is basically a loan and there's a loan origination process there's a processing, there's an underwriting, there's a, a, a closing and a funding process. So very, very analogous to the mortgage process. Um, there's great information on this particular site, we trade. You can also go to IBM. There's a lot of research and white, and white papers on there that talk about it. And you, I encourage you guys to read that and use it for your own personal knowledge base. Because I truly believe we're going to be living in a blockchain world here pretty soon. Uh, it's happening. Um, and also, as you work with your teams and you start educating people, it's always good to learn what others are doing, right? And so if you're in financial services, you're in banking, you're in the banking sector, uh, this is a great uh, benchmark to look at and see how they're doing it. Uh, I know it may not, uh, it's not the product, it may not be the mortgage product, but it is a financial product and, it, and it's going through uh, pretty much the same uh, origination and servicing process that a mortgage would go through. So I wanted to share that and uh, I put the link in there. And if anybody has any questions, comments, or if we can be of any assistance, our contact information is in the wiki page. Highly encourage you guys to sign up, get access to that wiki page. There's a lot of valuable information there. So back to you, Marvin. Okay, uh, thanks, Angel. That that's great information. Um, just uh, on the last slide is our contact information. If you guys do have any questions, and also the contact information for Karen and, and Vipin, uh, I mentioned their names kind of at the beginning. So, last chance for any questions, comments, or feedback from everyone. Okay, guys, we're going to give you ten minutes back to your day. Thank you very much. We definitely appreciate the time and hopefully you'll join us at our next uh, Hyperledger meeting. Have a great day, everyone.